in the uh, allotted time. It's just not possible. Philosophizing. All right, so we started part of this lesson on Friday. And uh, look, Algebra 2, beginning of the year, we're reviewing a lot of Algebra 1 practices. I go through these things kind of quickly. And here's my philosophy right now. Um, most of you were pretty good with these things in Algebra 1. Uh, there's no need then for me to belabor that and give you a ton of homework over each of the concepts. Now I am going to give you some tonight, but look, you have to be responsible at this point. You know, your your sophomores, your juniors, you have to begin to think. Okay, I you know I I need to understand this stuff. So if if I assign a couple problems and and you don't know how to do that area, then maybe you need to give yourself a few more problems and look more into it and get the thing figured out. That's really what you need to do, all right? So be careful in this first chapter because things are going to come very, very quickly and very, very rapidly. Um, where we may have taken three days to cover three separate topics in Algebra 1 and Chapter 1, we maybe are going to cover them in, in one period or maybe half a period because it's review. So just be careful, be careful, be careful. Be careful. And remember, I'm available after school, 3.15 to 4. If you want to come in and ask questions, you want to come in and get some help over uh, an area, you want to come in and work homework and ask me homework questions, I'm available uh, each of those days, except Wednesday this week we have a staff meeting. So just keep that in mind. And uh, all right, so enough of that. Let's get into it. So we talked already about the product property. Uh, remember, you got to recognize the condition. The product property is when you have like bases. So we know, you know, you got an exponent, you got a base, and so, you know, the situation here is, huh, I don't know how I ended up with yellow, you know, you got like bases, the base is an X in both cases. That's what the rule involves. So when you're multiplying like bases, you add the exponent. It's pretty simplistic. Where will you get in trouble? If you misappropriate the base, you got to know what the base is, and that's what those couple examples were about. All right, then the next was an exponent to an exponent. And hopefully you're thinking I multiply the exponents. Pretty simplistic. All this rule is is, again, a shortcut. I don't know what happened to the rule here. Oh, Windows is going to do this to me a lot this year. Oh, I'm stuck with yellow again. So remember, you're going to multiply the exponents. x to the a to the b equals x to the a times b. And you're simply multiplying those exponents. Again, what do you have to be careful with? Hey, what is and is not the base? So, for example, number two, some of you guys were off there because you weren't thinking that only what was in the parentheses was the base. Be careful with that. All right, so a couple examples there with those and in that situation. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Zero exponent property, not, a, not very hard. Most students don't have issue with this, but I do want you to remember and understand what's going on. Um, so this is any base to the zero power. Any base to the zero power. Any base to the zero power. And you got to remember, again, it only applies to the base. You, you can only apply the exponent properties to its base. So the ultimate answer is what? Do you remember? X to the zero equals one. All right, it equals one. Does anybody remember why it equals one? Anybody remember why? John? Not quite, but at least you tried. Anybody remember why it's 1? All right. Well, I told you it before, and maybe now it'll stick. But the 0 power is the base divided by itself. And that's why you end up with 1. A 0 exponent means you're, you take the base and you divide it by itself. And that's what number 1 says. Any base to the 0 power is the base divided by itself. So why do you get 0? Because it's x divided by x, and anything divided by itself is 1. So as long as you don't misappropriate the base, you'll be fine. So in the first example, you know, you're just going to write one. If you had this as a problem, you're going to write one as the answer. But I hope you're thinking, hey, this is 19 over 19, hence the reason it's 1, right? Number 3 there to the right. So 
the whole 5 x squared y is the base, do you agree? Right? Everything's the base. So if we were to write the rule, and again, if you were doing this on homework or a quiz or test, you don't need to write the rule. I'm just trying to get you to remember it. And look, obviously, how many of you remembered it from two years ago? Zero of you. Well, you weren't willing to give it to me, so... Um, so, it, you know, it might help to write it a few times. Maybe it'll stick. And again, you end up with 1. All right, so go ahead and do 4. What's 4? All right, so I'm curious on 3. Give me your answer out loud, okay? Here we go. 1, 2, 3. Okay, and I heard one, and I heard negative seven. So which one is it? One of those is right, one of, them is, one of those is wrong. Which is it? Again, don't misappropriate the base. That is the part that's to the zero power, right? So indeed, what, what do you have? You have a negative seven times an x divided by x. You have a negative seven times one. This thing is negative seven. How many got that right, by the way? Yeah, and that's usually what happens... Because, again, you forget, and, again, you misappropriate the base. You know, look at number three. Everything's in a parentheses. Everything's the base. Number four, everything's not in a parentheses. That zero only goes to that x. This is a negative seven times an x to the zero power. So you end up with a negative seven times one. All right, so based on that, everyone's going to get five correct, right? So you're all going to get five correct now that you're thinking right. And everybody says the answer to five is... Two, right? Of course. Because again, this is the part that's one, right? And two times one is two. You just got to keep track of what the base is. 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 All right. Next rule. Quotient property. And again, what's the condition? You have to have like bases. All these rules are shortcuts. All they are are time savers. That's all they are. They're designed to help speed you up. All right, so x to the a divided by x to the b equals x to the a minus b, right? You subtract the exponents. So again, all the rule is is a shortcut. So if you look at that first example, 5 to the 9th divided by 5 to the 4th, obviously the answer is going to be 5 to the 5th. Okay, so let me just show you why. So this, this is the long way, 5 to the 9th. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 5 to the 9th, right? And what's the bottom? One, two, three, four. Five to the fourth, right? And of course, that one's divided out by that one, and that one's divided out by that one, and that one's divided out by that one, and that one's divided out by that one. And what do you have? Five to the fifth. And, and what's the rule doing? It's just a shortcut to save you from doing all that. So again, we know we end up with five to the fifth. Okay, so again, be careful. You don't misappropriate the rule only apply it to its base. So how about this problem here to the right? What do you get when you have 3n to the 11th divided by n to the 5th? Tell me, raise your hand, tell me what you get on that one. 3n to the 11th divided by n to the 5th. John? John says 3n to the 6th. Anybody agree with John? 3n to the 6th. And I'm surprised more hands aren't up because he is correct. Look, the exponent rule goes to the ends. Look, this is no different than a 3 times n to the 11th over an n to the 5th. You're applying the exponent rule here. And so if I were to do all the steps, this would be 3 times n to the 11 minus 5. And what do you end up with? 3 times n to the 6th, 3 n to the 6th. Okay, so with that in mind, you look at that last example. So again, you've got to be careful here. 
Hey, when you have fractions and you have numbers, what, do you, what are you always looking to do with your fractions and numbers? What are you looking to do? Reduce. So, so you've got some reducing and you've got some of the exponent rules. So do this, do this example here. 12a to the fifth divided by 18a to the fourth. So you've got some reducing and you've got some of the exponent rule. Okay, so just refresh your thinking on reducing. 12 is a 2 times 6, and 18 is a 3 times 6, and the 6 divided out, right? And so number-wise, you should have ended up with a 2 in the top, a 3 in the bottom, and then what do you have? a to the 5th divided by a to the 4th is a to the 1st, so 2a over 3. How many had 2a over 3? All right, so a lot of rust out there, so you guys are going to have to knock the rust off. These are all things that we did extensively in Algebra 1. And so you've got to knock the rust off. By the way, this is the exact same thing as 2 thirds A. Right? Those are the exact same thing. What's, what's, what's an A? An A is just like an A over 1. And what's a 2 thirds times an A over 1? Top times top, bottom times bottom. And it's a 2A over 3. It's all the same thing. Right? It's all the same thing. So 2A over 3 or 2 thirds times A, it's all the same thing. So if you didn't know it, you did have it correct after all. All right. Next rule. Power of a quotient property. Um, so what happens if you have a fraction as the base? That's what this one is. Your, your base is a fraction. Well, all you do is apply the exponent to the numerator and the denominator. That's, you just apply it both ways. So this thing is going to be, the numerator is going to be x to the a and the denominator is going to be y to the a. You just apply the exponent to both numerator and denominator. Apply the exponent to both the numerator and the denominator. So then this first example, you're going to have a 2 cubed in the top. Right here, I won't, I'll, we'll not skip the step the first time. 2 cubed over n cubed. Pretty simplistic. And look, we, we do want to simplify whenever we can. And hopefully we know 2 cubed is an 8. So your really final answer would be 8 over n cubed. So let me pause for a second. Do you see how you're kind of using this second power property in both the top and the bottom, it's really what we're doing. Because whenever you have a fractional base, that numerator could have some exponents in and of itself, and so can the denominator. And so you got to be careful because you may end up using the power property. So this next example, if you look, that's what's going on. So see, in this second example, what's your numerator at 2a squared? And so what are you cubing? A 2a squared. And then on the bottom, what are you cubing? A b to the fourth. So let me not skip a step on this one. And hopefully it makes sense, right? You have a 2a squared that is cubed. That's the top. And the bottom is a b to the fourth that is cubed. Does that make sense? Right? We're cubing the top, the numerator, and we're cubing the bottom, the denominator. Now, again, if you wanted to, you could write out 2a squared over b to the fourth times 2a squared over b to the fourth times 2a squared over b to the fourth. But that's the long way. And especially, what if the exponent was a 7 or a 10 or a 15? Then you'd be writing it out 15 times. Well, remember, the rules are all shortcuts, time savers to help you. Well, we're not done, right? All right, so now in the top, you got to apply the power property. And in the bottom, you got to apply the power property. So see if you can finish it off. What do you get when you cube 2a squared? What do you get when you cube b to the fourth? What do you get when you cube 2a squared? And what do you get when you cube b to the fourth? All right, so what do you got on the top? All right, Kyle said 8a to the 6. Tommy said 2a to the 6. Which is it, 2 or 8? Eight? Eight. It's 8, all right? 
So don't forget, this, one, this 2 has a 1 exponent, and it's going to end up 2 cubed, which is 8, times a to the 2 times 3, which is 6. And the bottom is just b to the 12. No problem there, usually. But again, see, this is the power rule. And we had this example earlier when we did the power rule, where you've got more than just one thing as the base. You know, the bottom, the base is only the, you know, the b to the fourth, where here you've got two things. You've got to apply that exponent to both. All right, so that's 8a to the sixth over b to the twelfth. Negative exponents. Yeah, awesome. Let's do some negative exponents. Let's see if this thing's going to move on me again. Okay, so negative exponents. x to the negative a. Anybody remember the rule? Raise your hand. Tell me the rule. Justin? 1 over x to the a. 1 over x to the positive a. That is correct. Oh, windows. So x to the negative a equals 1 over x to the positive a. All right, so also what if you have 1 over x to the negative a? Somebody tell me what does that equal? What's this second one? 1 over x to the negative a. Tommy? X to the a. Just x to the a, and that's correct. Just x to the a. So look, a shortcut in all this, time saver, main concept is simply this. Change the sign of the exponent when taking the base and its exponent across the fraction bar. Change the sign of the exponent when taking the base and its exponent across the fraction bar. So if you look back at the first rule again, though you may not see it, isn't x to the negative a the same as x to the negative a over 1? And didn't we end up with the x to the negative a in the denominator now? We took it across the fraction bar. And in the second example, it was on the bottom, and now we put it in the top. You know, this is the same as that. So we took it across the fraction bar. And I'll show you what I mean here in a, a last example that I'll write. All right, so let's see if we can apply this a little bit. So 3 to the negative 2, hopefully you're going to say that's 1 over 3 squared, right? And then finally you're going to say that's 1 ninth. Does that make sense? Right? See, the negative exponent is saying do 3 squared in the denominator. Number 3 to the right, so that's the second rule. Now it's in the denominator. It's going to go to the top, right? 2 cubed in the top. And, of course, a 2 cubed is an 8. All right, so what do you do with this negative 4 to the negative 2? Keep the negative on the top. Keep the negative on the top. All right. Let me, let me ask you this. Don't write this. Are these two the same? Is this the same as that? Are those two the same? No, they are not. All right. If it was the top one, you'd take the whole negative 4 squared and put it in the denominator and leave that parentheses. But as you guys did say correctly, that negative stays in the top. And it's the 4 squared that goes to the bottom. So this thing ends up negative 1, right, over 4 squared. And we end up at negative 1 16th. And again, if we wanted you to treat it as a negative 4 to the negative 2, we would put it in parentheses for you so you would know. And if we don't put it in parentheses, then we expect you to know that, look, this is actually the exact same thing as a negative 1 times a 4 to the negative 2. It's exactly the same thing. But we don't bother to write negative 1 times 4 to the negative 2. We just write negative 4 to the negative 2. Exact same thing, though. And so we expect you to understand that. And you say, well, how do I know? Well, again, if the negative was part of the 4 as the base, we'd put it in parentheses for you. We'd show it to you that way. So in 5, then, what are you going to do with 5 to simplify it? 
Because here's the reality. We don't want you to leave your answers with negative exponents. The only time you can have a negative exponent in your, in your answer is if you're asked to leave your answer in a negative exponent. Every other time, you always change negative exponents to positive. The only time you don't is when you're asked not to. So somebody raise your hand, what would number five be? What's number five? Zach? So like this, 2x to the fifth. How many agree? 2x to the fifth. OK? And you guys all misappropriated the base again, right? Uh, right? I mean, remember, this is the key concept. If you're going to get these things correct, you can only apply the rule to its base. Is 2 part of the base? Does the exponent go with the 2? And the answer is no. The exponent doesn't go to that 2. So as long as you don't misappropriate the base, you'll be OK. But that 2 just stays down there, because it's, it's, it's a 2 times an x to the negative fifth. But again, we don't write 2 times x to the negative fifth. We expect you to know that. You say, well, how do I know if it's not the other? We to use the parentheses. So it's only the x to the fifth that comes to the top. So x to the fifth over 2. Okay. x to the fifth over 2. Look, here's the shortcut. Negative exponents in the bottom become positive exponents when you take them across the fraction bar, right? Again, anytime you take a base and its exponent across that fraction bar, you change the sign of the exponent. If I wanted to, look, if I had something like 2n to the 9th, if I wanted to, I could stick the end of the ninth in the bottom and make it end of the negative ninth. Now, I don't want to because we don't leave negative exponents, but I could. Again, take the base and its exponent across the fraction bar. You change the sign. All right, so number six now, we've got to deal with a fraction base, right, and the negative exponent. So that's two-fifths to the negative two, right? So would you believe two to the negative two? Divide it by 5 to the negative 2, right, so far? All right, finish it, because remember, you can't have negative exponents. 2 to the negative 2 divided by 5 to the negative 2. Finish it off. 2 to the negative 2 divided by 5 to the negative 2. All right, you said 25 fourths, right? Again, no negative exponents. So the 2 to the negative 2 goes to the bottom, and it's 2 squared in the bottom. 5 to the negative 2 goes to the top. 5 squared, 25 fourths, right? Voila. Good to go. Beautiful. Shaking out the cobwebs. Next page. All right. More review. Polynomials. Oh, yeah. All right. So just terminology. The degree of the polynomial is the degree of the highest degree term. All right, so let me see if I can refresh your memory on polynomials. Polynomial. All right, so a term is anything separated by addition or subtraction. So this first example has three terms. Do you agree? The 5x squared is one term, the 3x is the second term, and the negative 1 is the third term. All right, so what do you call a polynomial with three terms? Anybody remember? Trinomial. trinomial. All right, so it's a trinomial. So that's the type. And let me refresh your memory on degree. To figure out the degree of a term, you sum the values of the exponents. But remember this, you only count exponents for variables, not for numbers. Okay. So this first term has a degree of 2 because of the x squared. The second term has a degree of 1 for the x to the first power. The third term has a degree of 0. So the degree of the whole polynomial is 2, right? the degree of the highest degree term. Right. You add the variables for any given term, but to figure it out for the whole polynomial, it's whatever the highest degree term is. Okay, so what kind of polynomial is B? 
right? So one is mono, two is bi, three is tri, and then everything else we just call polynomial, right? So this is a binomial. Bi for two. All right, so now you've got to figure out what's the degree of the front term, what's the degree of the back term. Whichever one is higher, that's going to be the degree of the polynomial. So figure it out. What is the degree of this polynomial? Don't say anything out loud on this one. What is the degree of the polynomial? All right, here we go. On three, give me an answer. One, two, three. Okay, I was expecting a couple different answers. I heard four, and I heard six, and I think I heard seven. Four, six, and seven. Who had four? Who had six? Who had seven? Okay, so I, so I thought we had all three, four, six, and seven. Okay, so this back one is four, right? Because remember, a z is a z to the first, three and one is four. But the front one is 3, because again, you don't count exponents for numbers. It's the exponents of the variables. So this is a fourth degree, fourth degree. Just don't count the exponents of, the, um, of numbers. And by the way, whoever said 6, you forgot to add the 1 for the y, right? And you should have gotten 7. So if you're going to be wrong, you should have been wrong with 7, not wrong with 6, all right? But it's still wrong. That one's a 3, and the back one is a 4, the degree of a polynomial. You might say, what's the big deal about degree? Stuff like this. You know, those of you that go to advanced math next year, calculus, Mr. B, maybe even in college, and you have to take a math course. You know, uh, the teacher's going to be teaching, they're going to say something like this. Well, we have a fifth degree polynomial. And, and already you should be forming in your mind, okay, fifth degree, I've got something that adds to the fifth power. More than that, normally with polynomials, there's only one variable. So normally when we say fifth degree, it's usually like an x to the fifth. What's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal is there are five solutions, up to five solutions, for a fifth degree polynomial, if it's an equation. 8th degree up to 8 solutions, 10th degree up to 10 solutions, 50 degree up to 50 solutions. The number of solutions matches the degree of the polynomial. That's really the big deal about it all. We'll get into more of that here as we go along. Okay, so C for equations, there are as many complex number solutions as the degree of the polynomial. And maybe I should have said there are up to as many that might be better because the, the problem is sometimes you have the same answer multiple times. For example, if you had a third degree equation polynomial, it's possible that there are th there, there's three solutions, but all three could be x equals 2. So usually we just say x equals 2. We don't say it three times. All right, so anyhow. You're not following that. I'll show you that more when we get into them, per se. OK, so example here. You've got x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x plus 6 equals 0. There are three solutions to this. And again, sometimes they're all the same. Why are there three solutions? Because this thing is third degree, right? to give you the third degree. We'll deal more with that when we get into polynomial equations, and that's coming soon. But that's just a key concept. Third degree, three solutions. Squared, two solutions. Fourth degree, four solutions, etc., etc., etc. All right. Hey, don't forget this. Only like terms can be added. And of course, that means subtract it as well. Remember like terms. What are they? They have the same variables, and the variables have the same exponents. So they're the same things. 
you know, three apples and five more apples is eight apples. But three apples and five oranges is three apples and five oranges. Right? Can't add them. Not like terms. Same thing in math. All right, so how did I teach you guys to do these? Refresh your memory. First off, we, we do like to put things in order. This is the highest degree term. Is there anything else to add to a 5x squared? And the answer is no. Do you see any other x squareds? We can't add anything with it. So that's going to be our front term. That thing's going to go out front. Here, I'm going to use my red. Let's do the x's. There are my x's, right? So I have seven of them and eight more of them. And now we're back to like second grade, right? All right, and Sally says, Sally, 7 and 8 is 15. All right, beautiful Sally, right? So there's 15 of them. And then I'm going to use my green here. We also have Ys, right? And you just got to figure out how many of them you have and add them up. So how many Ys do we end up with? Negative five, right? Because we don't show ones, but that a negative y is the same as a negative one y. So four negatives and one more negative, five negatives. Okay. To be careful in something like the second example, what do you have to do with this negative sign right here? Right? I heard distribute. All right, so don't forget, you've got to distribute this. This is the same thing as a negative one out in front. So if I were to rewrite what happens when we distribute, you got 3x minus 2y minus 7x, and we all know minus a minus is a plus, plus 5y. Now you're ready to add up like terms, right? You should do them in alphabetical order. So 3x's and a negative 7x's is a negative 4x, right? And two negative y's and five positive y's leaves three positive y's, right? Negative 4x plus 3y, adding like terms. Tim and Tim, you guys are the only two I haven't had in Algebra 1, so you guys really need to be careful to speak up. And uh, I know what I taught everybody else because I taught it to them. And they may not remember it either. But I know I taught it to them, all right? I know we went through all this stuff, each and every bit. And so I'm going fast because I know what I gave them. Again, they may not remember it, but I know what I gave them. But I don't know what you guys had, so you're going to have to speak up. You're going to have to ask questions. You may have learned it differently. You may have learned adding like terms the, the long way. You know, for example, these x's. You may have learned uh, 3 minus 7x, therefore negative 4x. You may have gone the long route. I don't know. But if you're not following what's going on, you've got to ask questions. You've got to raise your hand, and I'll stop and help you, all right? But be careful because, again, I know what I taught these guys. I don't know what you had. All right, multiplying monomials. Pretty simplistic. You've got to distribute um, to some degree. But it's number times number, variable times variable. So in this case, right, it's a 3 times a negative 5. So that's a negative 15. The second thing is the exponent rule, right? x to the first times x squared is x. x to the first times x squared is x cubed, right? Come on, think. Don't write. Think. Don't copy. You can't copy in class. If you're a class copier, all right, you're going to Xerox yourself to oblivion come quiz and test time. You know, you're not, you're not in your seat Xeroxing. If you're in your seat just copying, then you're not learning a thing, nothing. You've got to be thinking, 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 thinking. All right, so what's y squared times y cubed? Y to the fifth, right? Remember, x to the a times x to the b equals x to the a plus b. It's okay. Keep, keep working, and you'll stop making mistakes in them, and you'll be okay. All right, so look, there's no plus signs or anything here between anything, right? This is one thing times a second thing times a third thing. And it's different because this negative's inside the parentheses, not outside. This is all multiplication. 
So we're going to do numbers times numbers. Negative 2 times 5, negative 10. But be careful. Negative 10 times this negative 1, right? That negative sign in front is like a negative 1, but we don't write the 1. That's what gets students in trouble. So negative 10 times negative 1 is positive 10, and we have 10 for the number. Let's do the variables in color. Let's, let's do the x's in red. So now it's just variable times variable. So you got an x squared times an x cubed. We already took care of the negative, right? Right? Because the negative was a negative 1. So it's x squared times x cubed, and that is x to the fifth. Let's do our y's in green. So we get a y times a y squared times a y squared. So y times y squared times y squared is y to the fifth as well. And then we just got z left, right? And so you got z left, z. 10, x to the fifth, y to the fifth, z. Wonderful. Beautiful. Bon de bois. All right, last thing. I think, right? Better be last thing. Did 18,000 things today, but that's what happens in the beginning of the year. All right, multiplying uh, polynomials, this is when you got to distribute. So distribute, distribute, distribute. And again, we're trying to refresh your memory. It's been a couple years since algebra. Let's refresh our memory. So remember, anything out in front of a parentheses means multiply. So this first thing is a 2x times a 5x. So 2 times 5 is 10. x times x is x squared. Make sense? 10x squared? But then you also have to distribute that to the negative 3. So Quinn, what do you get when you do 2x times a negative 3? negative 6x, and that's how that stays. Can you add an x squared and an x? You can't, right? They're not like terms, so it's 10x squared minus 6x. That's as far as we can go with that. That's all we can do, distribute. So two binomials. I don't know if you guys learned the FOIL method. Does that ring a bell? First, outer, inner, last. Tim, Tim, first, outer, inner, last. No? Good, because I don't teach it anyhow, because all you do is distribute. All right, so here I'm going to use my red. This first x has to get multiplied to everything in the back parentheses. x times 3x is 3x squared. All right? x times 3x, 3x squared. And we have to also multiply the x times the 4 x times a positive 4 is a positive 4x. I'm going to take my green. Hey, be careful here. It's a negative 3 I'm distributing, right? I always teach my students, keep the sign with the number. It's a negative 3. Negative 3 times a 3x is a negative 9x. I like to line up my x's. And then a negative 3 times a positive 4 is a negative 12, right? We're distributing. We're multiplying everything in the back parentheses by that term in the front. Now just add all this up. 3x squared minus 5x minus 12, right? 3x squared minus 5x minus 12, multiplying two binomials. So look, if you can distribute one thing times a parentheses, then you should be able to distribute twice two things. Or you should be able to do a binomial times a trinomial, or a trinomial times a trinomial, or a you know, four-term polynomial times a ten-term polynomial, though that would take forever, it'd be a pain. But you should be able to do it. So look, how would you do this thing, this last one? You're just going to distribute. All right, for time's sake. Let's just belt it out real quick. 3y times 2y squared, just say it if you know it. 6y cubed, right? So y times y squared, y cubed. All right, now let's distribute the 3y times the positive 4yz. What do you get there? And you need that plus sign, right? So plus 12y squared z. 
and now do the last distribution. What's 3 times a negative z squared? Negative 3 y z squared. Negative 3 y z squared. Good. You're thinking that's what you need to do. And now I'm going to take my green. And again, remember, this is a negative 2z that you're distributing. I'm showing you the negative example because that's usually where students make mistakes. So negative 2z times a positive 2y squared. Negative 4y squared z. See, again, I like to line up my like terms. Negative 4y squared z. I like to line them up because we're going to add them up at the end, right? And then a negative 2z times a positive 4yz is a what? Negative 8yz squared. Negative 8yz squared. And then the last distribution is a positive 2z cubed. And now we're just adding them up. See, if you line up your like terms while you're doing your multiplication, it just makes things nice and easy to finish off. 6y cubed plus 8y squared z minus 11yz squared plus 2z cubed. Beautiful. Math is so awesome. It's great. It's grand. Awesomely awesome. Hey, don't forget how to head your paper. Tim and Tim, be careful. In math, we do write the original. We do show some steps to work. Hey, if you got a problem like this, and the next thing you do is write the answer, you got your answer either from the internet or somebody else's paper. Because there ain't no way you're doing that in your head. Show the work. Something simple like earlier, hey, here, do you need to show any work? No, it's when you're doing the step as you go. It's a simple rule. You maybe don't have to show work, but where there's work, you got to show the work. Circular answers for us so that when we grade them tomorrow, we know what we're doing.